Hey guys, it's Mitch. How's it going? We're going to go and check out a classic today. We're going to take a look at G.I. Joe number one. Uh, this obviously isn't G.I. Joe number one. This is Tales of G.I. Joe number one, which is one of the many reprints which were necessary because everybody read fucking G.I. Joe, um, except for me. Uh, <laughs> I didn't. I never really got into the comic, and it seems a little uh, unseemly to have somebody who didn't read the comic talking about G.I. Joe, particularly when it has such a wide fan base. So I brought in a friend of mine. Uh, it's my buddy, Eric, who is a G.I. Joe fan. How you doing, man? Nice to speak with you this evening. Yep. And yeah, so we're going to just go over a little bit of history with G.I. Joe and uh, just kind of go through the issue here. So we should get started with uh, how G.I. Joe kind of came about as a property. So uh, Eric, you know, you, you know a bit about uh, how it got started there? Yeah, I mean, for me, from what I understand, is it goes back to the way back to the six inch, you know, the Kendall GI Joe from the sixties <laughs> and seventies. So yeah. that uh, that toy line was starting to kind of uh, lose its popularity for a couple of reasons. One was that the Vietnam War, during the Vietnam War, military yeah. toys started to kind of lose favor with the public. I could um, see that. Yeah, the military wasn't too popular in the United mm -hmm. States, um, even with during, Kung Fu Grip. Even with Kung Fu Grip didn't really didn't yeah. do it. <laughs> you so know, so Marvel cool. tried to make him, you know, like a astronaut. I mean, not Marvel. Um, Hasbro tried Hasbro. to make him like an astronaut. Yeah, Hasbro. Or, you know, like a scuba diver, whatever. But that didn't really work all that well. And then the final, I guess, nail in the six-inch figure coffin was the uh, oil embargo. Because that made the <laughs> okay. six-inch plastic figure, you know, not... Right. Yeah, it wasn't cost effective. So then eventually just Hasbro, you know, killed G.I. Joe. But then in the early 80s, um, Ronald Reagan became president and he mm -hmm. kind of reinvigorated the sense of patriotism and, um, you know, Americans love the military again. So G.I. Joe was reborn. <laughs> um, the only problem was that G.I. Joe was competing with Star Wars right. and He-Man and those properties had uh, vehicles to sell the yeah. toys so obviously star wars had probably the biggest franchise in movie history to sell the toys and then he-man had the tv show but hasbro didn't have anything to kind of promote the toys so they partnered with marvel to generate well, from what I, comic from what i from what i saw um the like the head of marvel and the head of hasbro bumped into each other like a charity event and they kind of talked it over from there like just spitballing i imagine and that oh, kind of, okay. you know, yeah, you know, do you maybe need something to help sell this thing? Yeah, it's kind of a win-win because the, the comic promoted the toys and the toys promoted the comic, right? So mm -hmm. it kind of worked out well for both of them. The other other interesting wrinkle was, I don't know the, the nature of the regulations, but there was um, pretty severe regulations in the United States about advertising toys to children. Yeah, you could only have like... Like I, I think it's like up to five seconds of animation. Right, exactly. Yeah. But there was no regulation for for um, animating a comic book. Right. So they used actually sold the the commercials sold the comic book, which was a backdoor to sell the toys. So it was exactly. kind of an unusual promotion. Well, they totally took advantage of the loophole. Yeah, and, and of it, course, yeah, yeah, and it uh, it actually moved the the comic like just crazy. And um, by virtue of that, the, the toys themselves, yeah. So getting started with the comic, um, they had, well, first they had to come up with a creative team, right? So a writer specifically. Yeah, exactly. And from, again, from what I understand, just from watching interviews and reading some interviews with uh, Larry Hama, mm -hmm. apparently the Marvel pitched this to all their writers and nobody yeah. wanted any part of it because writing a licensed you know, series for a toy line was kind of like the bottom of the barrel, you know, mm -hmm. so no, no writer with any integrity wanted to do it. He was an editor at that time. Right. And I, it had no future from what I understand, like um, licensed comics generally had uh, a life, like if it had a lifespan of two years, that was considered a good run. Right. Yeah, exactly. So Exactly. So nobody wanted any part of it. Yeah. But Larry Hama had an idea, which he pitched, I guess it was, would have been to, it was either Shooter or Martin Goodman, yeah. where he pitched this idea for a spinoff for Nick Fury, which was, uh, I think he called it Fury Force, mm -hmm. and it was rejected. So he accepted the G.I. Joe series and pretty much incorporated his ideas for Fury Force as G.I. Joe. He just changed some of the names, but 
um so cobra was hydra for example you know so um he just pretty much used the same ideas but now this is a chance to explore what he wanted to do and that is an interesting thing with uh, the comics influencing the toys which i mean they would have a huge influence from what i understand but um, originally the toy line didn't have an enemy it was just the joes right exactly right yes yeah, yeah. see for someone who doesn't hasn't read it you know quite a bit i've been um, on wikipedia all day man. oh okay okay <laughs> yeah yeah so that they just envisioned you know the executives had had the gi joes just fighting like star wars figures or you know yeah just or just teddy like bears or whatever. Soldiers or whatever right 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 and i think they they thought an enemy wouldn't sell you know yeah. kids wouldn't want to buy the enemy so even yeah. if you look at some of the early toys the GI Joe vehicles and figures far outnumbered the Cobra vehicles and figures. But then, as the toy line progressed, you know the balance is kind of more and more even as as Cobra vehicles and figures started to sell. That's true. Yeah. So just getting back to Larry Hama, uh, I spoke a little bit about this on um, the GI Joe yearbook number two video. I yes. Think. Yes. Yeah. Uh, but Larry Hama, who was the writer of G.I. Joe, or is the writer of G.I. Joe. Principal writer, still, yeah. He is still writing. I think he it. still is, right? He's still writing yeah. with Skybound, right? I think so, yeah. It, the IDW run is over. I, I think that ended around 300. And I guess he's still going. So it, it is with Skybound now? I think so. Image Skybound, yeah. I, I, I love that he's still doing that. Uh, I hate that he has to still do it, but I love well, that he I, is still doing it. It's funny because you remember Wizard Magazine in the 90s. I remember I was a huge fan of Larry Hama and G.I. Joe, and I, and I read an interview with him. He was he was writing so many things. He was writing like Wolverine. And, I love his Wolverine run. Uh, yeah, he, he was writing a bunch of stuff, and he just felt overwhelmed, so he, he had to cut back. And the two he kept were Wolverine and G.I. Joe. And they asked him, like, why G.I. Joe? Because this was 1992 or whatever. It was not selling yeah. a lot. It was, you know. And he said it's like his baby. You know, like he, he well, wanted to stick with it for as long as he could, even though he didn't have to. You know, well, he had like a, a he had like a formative voice in the creation of G.I. Joe. Because, I mean, like he was he was um, in very close communication with Hasbro when they were coming up yes. with characters, from what I understand. Yes. No, he wrote. You know, like each one of the file, each one of the figures had these these dossiers, like a file card on the back mm -hmm. of the card, um, just like with their bios and their personalities and whatnot. And he wrote pretty much all of all of those. So he created yeah. the characters. Yeah. You know, Hasbro would come up with the figures, and then he would create them as as people, as characters. Yeah, I love that. I know I do too, <laughs> and I think that's part of what made GI Joe so cool was that it it wasn't just an army man. It was a, you know it was a guy with a a name and a background and personalities and oh man you talk you can me like guys with like um specialized skills and code names and you know they've all got their own individual like costumes and weapons and shit yeah that's the best oh it's the best <laughs> it's 100 percent the best so uh we should start on the issue here so why don't we start with uh why not the cover i guess so um it's a pretty good one that's i mean it's definitely eye-catching the uh art on this one is by herb trimpy who I'm not really a fan of. There are trippy fans. Um, they're like they're they're like trippy truthers. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I like and, and, you know truthers. a little bit. I, I well, I think a lot more respectable probably because I mean like just uh, going through this earlier today and like you know trippy can draw. He, he's he's very competent. It's just not particularly exciting. Well, let me ask you as a as kind of the artist aficionado and historian. Mm -hmm. So we mentioned that Larry Hama, this is kind of like the bar bottom of the barrel for writers. Would that be true for, for the artists as well, doing a, a licensed series? Um, probably. Or, um, yeah, you would probably want to get either just like a veteran who wouldn't mess it up or like some kid who was, you know, who can train up on something. Um, Brett Blevins, I believe, got his start on Chris Star. Which okay. was, yeah, <laughs> Chris Star. Heard of that one. It, it, that one, I don't know. I had like a toy or two from that. That was um, Marvel tried to pull an Uno reverse where they would come up with a comic and then base a toy line on it. Oh, okay. and, and it, okay. it, it didn't work. But uh, it lasted like 12 issues and ended with an Alpha Flight crossover, which is always the kiss of death. <laughs> <laughs> um, and yeah, no, this 
as far as covers go, this is a pretty good one with everybody leaping out and all of these, everything converging on the center. Yeah. yeah it is. It's yeah. nice. It, it makes a lot of amazing like posters, lunch boxes. You know, yeah. I know I've had a lunch, uh, poster of this in my room. You know, oh, yeah? so it's, I did. Yeah. I, I <laughs> stared at it for like hours. <laughs> yeah. I, I was obsessed with G.I. Joe when I was a kid. I'm telling yeah. you, I, was obsessed. I still, still am a little bit obsessed. I got that impression. Yeah. <laughs> There's two things I, I kind of wanted to note on this cover. Um, oh, yeah. Is there anything that you know that stands out on this cover? Well, I mean, uh, I know that we we don't have um, all of the characters on here. Yes. That's where I was going. Is there's, there's one key character who's not on this cover, and that's yeah. Snake Eyes. Right. I wonder if it's just because Snake Eyes doesn't look as much like a soldier. I don't... I, I think... I don't know, but I, I know that... Again, going back to the start of G.I. Joe, when they produced the original, there were 13 figures that they produced. Mm -hmm. They're called the Green 13 because they mostly all wore green and they're hard to tell one from the other. Right. The most expensive part of the of the manufacturing process was the paint applications. So like painting their boots and their you know straps and whatnot. Right. That cost the most money. So as a way to kind of save money, instead of reducing the paint on all 13 figures they produced one figure with no paint at all and that figure was snake eyes ah, it was okay. just all black plastic and he wound up becoming the most popular figure i don't think they anticipated him being a breakout you know probably popular. not but i mean you know you, yeah you make the one guy who looks different from everybody else and you make him like right. you know all mysterious and black and yeah yes. see that. and he can't talk and he's a commando you know but i don't think initially they envisioned him as being, you know, the star of the series. Because he's not even really featured. He really is the Fonzie much. of G.I. Joe, isn't he? Oh, yeah, for sure. I mean, yeah. at one point, the, the, the series was called Snake Eyes and G.I. <laughs> Joe, right? So Was it, it really? Was, yeah, it was. I don't remember what. No, it was way toward the end. You know, they were trying everything to keep it keep it alive. Yeah. It was on life support. So they called it, um, I think it was called, like, Snake Eyes featuring G.I. Joe or G.I. Joe featuring Snake Eyes, something oh, like man. that. Oh, man. Yeah, so he was, it was pretty much his series at that point. Desperate times, okay. The other thing that I, this is a little, maybe I'm getting too nerdy on this, but the Movat, the tank, is blue mm -hmm. and not green. So you think I that think would, that's, I think that's just a matter of making sure they didn't blend into it. That's what I was going to ask you. Do you think it's because the, the figures are green, so they didn't want, yeah. they wanted some contract? All right. Because yeah, that could be yeah. confusing because, the Cobra vehicles are blue, right? So you would think that that could be a Cobra vehicle. That's true. But I mean, that that's that's kind of the nature of comics, too, where you can have some unnatural shit just so long as it, right, right. you know, just, just it works better as a color combination. I'm sure that yeah, was discussed. Yeah. No, but that's what I want to ask. If if it was the, the uniforms wouldn't stand out with the tank in the background like that. Yeah, I think that's probably the case. Green. Okay. All right. So let's get into this. So... So normally there are, um, oh, what are they? Just like inserts for vehicles and stuff all throughout this. Uh, because this is a reprint, I don't get that. I get 1988 ads. So we're going to get the odd just like infusion of neon on this. <laughs> okay, so. Well, this cover, this splash page has nothing to do with what's going on. It's just a cool image, right? No, I mean, is, is that... It's just they just jump into the flag and action and yeah, this is something along the lines of um, like Conan number one, where you get this like just title page that doesn't have anything to do with it. It's just to introduce you to the property, I think. Okay, right. Yeah. Okay. And I mean, in this case, absolutely, because this came out before the toy, didn't did it not? I think it did. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I mean, you know, they they need to tell you what the hell GI Joe even is. Well, there's no question that they're going for this patriot patriotic kind of vibe. Yeah, I thought it was a little subtle. <laughs> <laughs> Codename G.I. Joe, the most fearsome rapid deployment team of all stands ready to fight anywhere, anytime, anyway. So yeah, I do like that, how they're, yeah, like a special missions kind of team. Mm -hmm. yep, the like idea. a covert ops team, yeah. And Larry Hama, of course, has military experience because he was a, uh, what was it, a, a, like an armament and uh like a, a weapons and uh, and um, operations expert in Vietnam. In Vietnam, right? Yeah, right. Yeah, so he does have some some working understanding, which probably helped him. I'm sure. I think so. Well, I mean, you get a, you get all sorts of 
he, he did it in in the yearbook as well, where he got all sorts of um, specification about things like armaments or, uh, yeah, just weapons, tactics, that kind of thing. Oh yeah, he'll he he he's not shy about telling you what he knows. He won't just say I'm gonna shoot you. He'll say I'm gonna shoot you with this nine millimeter. Yeah, absolutely. Full metal jacket, this that you know. Yeah, he he wants you to know what what he knows. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, so we're going to start things off. This is somewhere between New York City and Washington, D.C. in the jungle. <laughs> I assume this is more like a forest kind of thing. Okay. <laughs> Either that or Trimpy just didn't get the memo. <laughs> it wasn't a direct line. Maybe they took some detours down to there. Okay, yeah. Part of. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so this is uh, going to be the focus of this issue. This is... Oh, she's uh, Doctor. Oh, okay. So this is Doctor Adele Burkhart, and yeah, she's the nation's man. top nuclear physicist, and she's one of the brains behind the Doomsday Project. So um, they they kind of lay it all out for you here. So she claims she didn't know what was a Doomsday Project, and now she's supposed mm -hmm. to testify in front of some kind of congressional committee. And uh, so these are the like the MPs who are uh, just chaperoning her on this one. Right, and just a little touch, which Hama, I loved what he did things like this. Like, she was kind of a, a liberal, outspoken, anti-military, mm -hmm. right? You know, so if you're eight or nine years old, that's probably going over your head. Yeah, but you he, don't get he that. would still, yeah, you, you're not really appreciating her political ideology and how no. it would be a factor in the story. But it is a small yeah, it's, factor in the story. It's interesting because, yeah, I like, I'm sure there's... Like, you know, a, a kid can follow along well enough to go, okay, she's important. You know, she's yeah. got, yeah, she's got science stuff. <laughs> and then Cobra wants her for the science stuff. Right, 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 right. Whereas if you're reading this as, yeah, like a, you know, a kid or a, an adult maybe having to read it to his kid, you go, oh, this is actually a bit more interesting than I thought it was. Right, exactly. <laughs> he always put these little nuggets of, of and depth into the storytelling, which is why I think it lasted 155 issues i think so yeah what's interesting is the baroness this is one of my notes wasn't a toy at the time there was no figure not for a couple of years right right so yeah. so hama came up with this character that wasn't even a, a toy and he's mm -hmm. featuring her pretty extensively in the first issue i thought that that's pretty interesting it yeah is. like you said she became a toy in i think 84 right and this came out in 82 so this is kind of how the comic is influencing the toy instead of the other way around. Oh, big time, yeah. And so in the in the comic here, they're so they're grabbing this uh, the nuclear physicist here. Uh, I assume for her doomsday weapon knowledge. All right, yeah. So this is like a uh, kind of a joint operation between the uh, Cobra soldiers here and the Baroness and some more soldiers, but who were disguised as reporters. So this would be her here, uh, for instance. And yeah, so they kind of gun everybody down, and people do get gunned down in this yeah, comic. People die. People die, unlike okay. the cartoon. Yeah, because that was mandated in the in the cartoons. You can't have people die. So, and you know, even as kids, we always thought that was stupid. Right. So, yeah. I, every plane that got blown up, they'd go out of the way to show the parachute. Yeah. You know, every every tank, the guy. Shot. Yeah, the guy got out and ran out, and absolutely. Yeah, and yeah. When I was look, reading through the the yearbook, it was like, wait a minute, there's there's people dying in these vehicles. There's people like, dying, like, and that was that was like okay with the comics code authority, I guess, right? I mean, I guess they were allowed. Well, to I guess that death. that makes sense. Like soldiers, you know, soldiers die in war, and it's not glorifying it. Well, it's glorifying it a little bit, maybe, but it's a little glorified. Yeah, they're not going out of their way to make it. Uh, excessive, gory, that kind of thing, which is kind of what mm -hmm. the comics code was focused on. They were very specific about their wordings. Yeah, I think something like uh, soldiers dying in war, that would they would have been okay with that. Okay. All right. And I'm glad. Yeah, it <laughs> would have been really... It makes the comic a lot more entertaining. Well, even go back to Hama, I don't want to keep focusing on him, but he, he said something like the cartoon was, I think he said morally bankrupt. You know, like he hated the cartoon with a passion. Oh, really? Yeah, he did not like the cartoon. Okay, I was I didn't I didn't hear that at all. Yeah, I saw that in an interview where he's just really pushing back on the cartoon for that reason. He said there should be consequences for, you know, violence, right? Fair if enough. You know, you know, 
So what I noted here was I thought this was really cool. Again, this is like a Hama. I don't know if this would be Hama or maybe Trimpy, but that was that's a Soviet uh, helicopter. Oh, okay. You know, so I'm not familiar I, I with think, the design. Yeah, it's like the Mi six, maybe. I'm not. I'm not sure exactly which one it is, but it's a it's a mill Soviet helicopter. In the early issues, Cobras, most of their equipment was Russian built. You know, stuff, guns and tanks and. Again, that's just a cool, yeah, it's just a cool little subtle touch that makes it, you know, pretty awesome. To, to yeah, include, no. That the kids comic, you know, they could have made any yeah. generic helicopter, but they didn't. And so, yeah, they, they, they're able to, you know, make their way out with the, uh, the doctor here. So that's our, our premise for this issue. So first three pages, we've got basically like an inciting incident. So this is a situation that G.I. Joe is going to have to respond to. So we're going to cut to, this is General uh, Flag, I believe, right? Yes, General Flag. Yeah. Of the USS Flag. I always thought he was a, like a later edition. No, he was in the early comics, obviously. And I don't think he ever got a figure. Oh, I thought I think he, he wound up dying. I think he wound up getting killed in the, okay. in the comic. There were a few Joes that did. Yeah, yeah. And he, I think he was one of them. Yeah. So for this thing here, this is so, um, you know, at the Pentagon and the military muckety mucks are discussing the situation, seeing and and just deciding how they should respond to this. Um, General Flag, I think, is advocating for G.I. Joe to intervene. And uh, there's an interesting moment here where it's suggested, like, maybe it would be better to just send in, you know, like a like a regular army and have them fuck it up and they right. kill her. Yeah. And then we don't have to worry about it anymore. <laughs> yeah, again, that's Hama again, right? That's just a cool little touch. Yeah. It would be easier to kill her. Just just kill her. Like, we're going to waste elite soldiers to save this broad who doesn't even like us to begin with. Well, She's not only that, but I mean, there's the danger of her releasing secrets to Cobra as well, right? Right, that's what I'm saying. Yeah, so yeah. we're going to risk, you know, these top highly qualified operatives to save her when she's yeah. been bad mouthing us to the press anyway. Let's just kill her. And the reason they don't is because um, let's see here. We can't let her die because the whole world knows that we consider her an embarrassment. So if they let her, you know, if they fuck up a, a rescue operation, everyone's going to know it. they fucked it up on purpose. So they have to send in G.I. Joe because G.I. Joe is the only one who can like extradite her uh, and without making it a, a total clusterfuck. What do you think of that rationale? Do you buy I, that, or is that? I think it's better than just you know, I don't know. We we've, we've got a, a a dignitary over here that Cobra, you know, kidnapped, and GI Joe always deals with Cobra. So let's send GI Joe out. You know, I think I think it's a good enough one. Um, it's a little dark for <laughs> well, you know, just a, the idea that comic. if she dies, it'll make it, it'll look bad on us. Yeah, I mean, do you buy that? Yeah, but I, I assume what they're saying is like uh, the public perception. Yeah, yeah, the uh, the public will basically take them to task for allowing that to happen. Um, and I I kind of like that in that there there is like a like a like a through line of thought for it. Right. It doesn't yeah. have to be like you know super well motivated, really. I, I think it's just uh, there's enough there that you go, oh yeah, that's cool. Okay. Right. I mean, the bottom line, she's an American citizen. You got to do everything you can to save her. Oh, of course, right? Right, yeah. <laughs> All right, so... I get, I think this is our first appearance of uh, Cobra Commander, probably. I think so, yep. And, yeah, riding around on a horse in, like, Julius Caesar style. <laughs> yeah, you got the, <laughs> the whole full-on... This is just triumph. Industry. Yeah, <laughs> the triumph of the will right here. There's again, it's just nothing subtle about what he's going for. Yeah, what, what Hamo is going for. Um, just with the imagery, you know, this is obviously fascist imagery. Um, mm -hmm. although it's explained much later that I don't know if Cobra's ideals are really fascist per se. It's more anarchic, apparently. I always read it as more hyper capitalist survival of the fittest which i guess could be fascist i don't think they had a co coherent idea of what cobra was going to be you know they were probably kind of no. making it up as they went along he's just a bad no, guy i think that's you know i think that's mostly the case with with these things you know like any kind of property like this 
where you're just kind of making up what the story is. I don't think it's, you know, they plot out every nook and cranny of the universe. They just kind of go. And, you know, I think Hama had had a pretty in-depth idea of what he wanted to do. But, like, you know, I, I don't think he had every aspect figured out or anything. No, I don't think so either. And, and then what's on that What's on that bottom panel? I think this is something <laughs> you and I talked about. When yeah, you want to talk about jokes. it. Well, no, I mean, <laughs> <laughs> it's just a funny little... You yeah, know, so we we've got all of the uh, all of the Joes available here. So and you know, so we get their their little profile picture here with their name underneath, and um, these are all the toys. And then there's one here that's obscured yeah. by a woman's hand. Uh, we don't see his face; we just see his name, which is Shooter, which sounds like a GI Joe character. It could be a GI Joe character. Sure. So you think that's a Jim Shooter kind of wink, wink, right? Well, this here definitely is. Okay, because yeah. they cover part of his face, right? Yeah, so I mean, he wasn't you know, really intended to be a character. I think there's a mandate from Hasbro in this to get as much of the toys in here as possible. Yes. Yeah. So I mean, including like a lineup like this, where it's like, okay, these are all the ones I need to collect. So you don't you don't obscure. But what if you some <laughs> kid, some obsessive kid who's like, I need the shooter figure. I think, and he's I think freaking there were out. a couple. <laughs> yeah, you think so? He's like, I, I want to fit on Christmas and. Like he's a completist and he needs the whole series and he can't find the the fucking well, shooter. He, he can go he can go talk to Marvel's editor in chief about that, I guess. <laughs> uh so okay, so we're gonna start out with Hawk here. And Hawk is the leader of G.I. Joe at the time. Yes. Um this is and I, he kind of got cycled out um by the time I I was he was kind of replaced by Duke, who was like a yeah. more cooler, you know. So in the early issues, Hawk is kind of like uptight and like uh you know, he's no sense of humor. He's kind of like he's kind of a dick, really. Oh, okay. And then Duke is more like John Wayne, cool, you know, suave, charming. You know, so I think, yeah, they definitely face him out for Duke. But the right. problem is that Duke looks a lot like Hawk. He does, and then so they had to, you know, make when they do bring back Hawk eventually as General Hawk, they just got to make sure that he never takes off his helmet. Yeah, because he has brown hair <laughs> yes. to distinguish him from Duke. Yeah. Uh, so this is just him getting um, driven to the motor pool uh, at the behest of, uh, what is it, General Flag and General Austin, apparently, which is... Yeah, General Austin. Yeah. He may, Maybe he's the one who dies. I might have misspoke when I said Flag dies. One oh, I don't know. Spoilers. I'm taking your word for all of this, man. I've just spoiled it for anyone who didn't <laughs> read the series. And so this is uh, G.I. Joe's Fortress. It's all under this motor pool here. Yes, the Chaplain's so... Assistant Motor Pool at Fort Wadsworth, New Jersey. Do you know that off by heart? I do know it by heart. <laughs> <laughs> I do know it by heart. I'm telling you, I was obsessed with, with this stuff. I believe you. I'm, I'm believing you more. <laughs> and, all right, this page. Let me, can I ask you about this page? Yeah. So this is the the pit, right? This is their headquarters, this underground headquarters. And this is kind of their training area. Right. Does that look rigorous, that training? It I mean, looks the guy's a little shooting bit like a an... target three feet in front of them. It looks a little bit like a 1982 action play set. <laughs> there's just nothing going on on the floor. No. Like, there's just two guys wrestling. This looks so the most opposite of rigor I think, to me. I think part of this is this is part of this is the drawback of Trimpy a, a little bit, I think. Um, I would guess because I, I don't think um, Hama gave him any direct uh, instruction on what to put in here. Okay, Other so than, as a, you know, looking yeah. at it from an artist's eye, is that unfair to get Trimpy to include all that in one panel? I mean, it's tough. He can. I mean, like, see, that's the thing. I'm, I'm, I came up in the '90s where you know, when in doubt, add more detail, right? Okay. You know, where, where it's post Michael Golden, post Art Adams, you know, Jim Lee, all that shit. Um. Whereas 1982, we're talking like house style rules, in particularly in Jim Shooter's Marvel, okay, and yeah. you 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 got to be able to get a comic. And this is a big comic, by the way. This is like a 30 page story. Right, right. It's longer than the normal. I don't think he had time to do anything more intricate. Well, but if the script said something like, "All right, there's panel four. It's this training area of the pit. We need to see target practice, wrestling. We need to see a guy putting his gun together. We need to see, yeah. see a guy in like some." 
cryosphere thing like how would you do that as an as an artist how would you get all that into one i don't know yeah i i I mean i can think of ways to do it but not to do it in a way that wouldn't take like a week for me to draw you know (laughs) right okay okay (laughs) i I think this is it's not all i don't i don't think so i I think yeah this is partially like halfway between like just trippy being like a house style kind of guy and not having crazy visual flair and just you know operating on a pretty strict timeline okay all right so what do we got here so anyway but these are all of the gi joe characters anyway in here Uh, i'm sure we could match them all up with the heads from the previous page and so this is hawk here that's coming down right i believe so yeah i think so it's hard to tell because they all just have the same kind of uniform on right so it's yeah Uh, he looks just like a he looks just like a regular general, but yeah, no, I'm, judging by when he takes his hat off, he's got the flat top here. I think right, right, like. right. And so he's going to run through the mission briefing. So there, uh, this is where Cobra is holed up. This is on, um, so this is an island with a Spanish castle on it, I believe. Mm-hmm. Yep. Could be um, maybe like off the Azores or something. I'm, I'm not, I don't know if they clarify where it. Yeah, this is like a hologram for a presentation, which is uh, kind of early to be doing that kind of thing i would think i mean that's always another cool thing i always found about joe joe is like it was state of the art technology but not over the top science fiction mm-hmm. you know what i'm saying so later in the episode later in this the issue they'll show like a laser gun and it's kind of limited like it has a battery that only lasts so long i always thought that was cool that it's like not over the top science fiction it's kind of like plausible well most of the stuff in here yeah is rooted in um well, actual like achievable technology. Right, exactly. That's the yeah. what I was looking for. Achievable. Yeah. And we're just gonna get our run through on what everybody's gonna do for the mission here, I think. So the Vanguard's gonna be Grunt, Stalker, and Short Fuse. They're gonna approach from the uh from this the sea here. And they're gonna take out the beachfront, I believe. Let's see. Take out the airfield tower and hangar, leaving one small aircraft intact. So that's gonna be their escape plan, I take it. Uh Flash and Breaker are gonna take care of the radar. And there was, they also mentioned some uh, electrified fencing that they're going to have to get through. Oop. Yeah. Scarlet and Snake Eyes are going to knock out the generator in the fort as their own uh, small unit. They're like an infiltration unit. And they do, um, this is short fuse here uh, okay. with the glasses, I guess. They do bring up the idea of just like, you know, leaving her to die because she's apparently a traitor. Right, um, right. Yeah. And uh, she's like, no, no, no. She's an American. She's an American citizen. Who, who gives the lecture? Is that... uh, this is, I think that's Hawk here. Okay, okay. So he's like, yeah, that's what I'm saying. He's kind of like an like a, annoying. Yeah, you wouldn't you wouldn't really have Duke just... doing that. Right, Duke. Yeah, yeah. Duke wouldn't he'd be like, we're not. He he just wasn't even gonna do it. He's like, nah, we're not. We're not. He wouldn't be all preachy about it, you know. Yeah. And they might not even say it in front of Duke, you know. So it's... at the very least, he wouldn't point the finger like that. <laughs> yeah, he wouldn't. <laughs> let, he wouldn't <laughs> preach to the guy. He's a little bit more laid back. Yeah, he's much more laid back. So yeah. Where I, he sums it up here, where soldiers, our job is to follow orders and to do the impossible and make it look easy. Uh, so from there, we're going to cut to Cobra Island. Oh, this is Cobra Island early, eh? No, it's a different island. Oh, okay. Cobra Island was much later. They kind of, I always thought that was the coolest uh, storyline, how they aggravated. They, so they tricked G.I. Joe into dropping a nuke on an underground bunker, which aggravated a fault line. And that fault line became an, an island, an unclaimed island. So Cobra seized that island and then petitioned the UN for sovereign statehood. I was that, that is really cool. fucking sick. I know. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's, really, that's really fucking sick. I remember just being like blown away by that. Yeah. Like it was the coolest freaking thing ever. Like they, how did he come up with that? That's ridiculous. That is awesome. Yeah. So G.I. Joe <laughs> couldn't touch the island because that would have been. All right, a, a well, violation of international law. Yeah, declaration of war. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Right. <laughs> All right. So we're now we're gonna get our first close up on Cobra Commander here. Yeah, finally. Um, this is Hood variant. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, not much to speak on, on the visuals on here. I mean, you know, we, this is all right. It's it's a it's a castle that's been converted for uh, military use. It's always good. And we yeah, get our. This is the Cobra salute here. Yeah, that's cool. <laughs> that didn't last long. That's another one of the notes I had. I think by issue five or six, they stopped doing that. 
<laughs> the, the the Heil. It's tough because yeah, like like you know, the good one's taken, and you don't want to use it. So <laughs> <laughs> right, right, right. And it looks like his arm is unusually long. For... Well, this is straight arm GI Joe era, right? <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> it looks like if he dropped his arm, it would go to the floor. Yeah, I, I mean, you know, it's not too bad. Okay, so um, in the in the in the castle here, we've got the Doctor who's being held captive by Cobra, and Cobra Commander is uh, he's not real. You'd expect him, I guess, to be trying to intimidate her and trying to get information out of her. He's not even really bothering with her. He's more anticipating the Joe response to this, um, which is interesting. So um, he's expecting the Joes to uh, yeah, invade on the North Beach. So he dispatches two heavy weapons platoons there. And on their way, they can stop at the fishing village, which comes back to carry out the, con the contingency plan. This is so always interesting, too. I'm sorry. This is, I always found this fascinating. was that in the comic... Cobra and Cobra Commander were formidable enemies, as opposed to the cartoon series. Which that's was... the thing. I'm familiar with the cartoon where they're bumbling fools. Yes, you know? right. He was just yeah. such a clumsy idiot. But he was Cobra was actually pretty good at what they did, and he was mm -hmm. pretty smart. He was a, he was a good villain. This is interesting. He's like one step ahead of the Joes. Yeah, exactly. And that would right. never be the case on the cartoon. Yeah. No, in the cartoon it was just silliness. It was just idiotic <laughs> that one pat i got us what is that on that previous page was it one two three four panel four yeah. it's just the one of cobra commander that cobra symbol in the background's awful it's the uh... one behind his head it's just like a circle yeah it doesn't look the same as this <laughs> come on Trent. Eh, it's fine i didn't i didn't even notice it and i mean you know kids don't notice that shit <laughs> you don't think <laughs> I noticed it. I don't know. Maybe something's wrong. I don't know, but, you know, like, You're that OCD kid. Yeah, it might be that OCD kid that needed you, the you, shooter. Exactly. <laughs> okay, so this is the um, this is the invasion force. Yeah, I believe they're going to break up though, because this is pretty much everybody. Yeah. So we got Scarlet and Snake Eyes in with Stalker. At, yeah. So this is oh, and this is Breaker. I think with the bubble gum. Yeah, I think I, again. I think they tried to give him some visual quirks to separate one from the other because they're all the same yeah. uniform. And short fuse with the glasses here. Glasses, it is, right. It is tough to differentiate them. It is, especially for a kid, right? Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, Cobra's uh, waiting for them here. Um, you get some kind of Kirby-esque looking uh, hardware waiting for I them. I thought that's a cool panel. I don't know. That, that one looks kind of cool to me. I like that one, all right. And we're going to kick things off with Stalker flying in in his jump jet. And blowing everything away here, really. Violence. Yeah, it's good shit. It is pretty and, good. And then they, uh, yeah, they come in on the, uh, on the pontoon here. And yeah, it's uh, kind of a shock and awe thing. He looks like he's dropping grenades and just shooting everything up. And uh, some of the cobras are running off for the trees, and some of them don't make it, which is cool. I, I like it. I like it. So yeah, uh, Stalker was essentially able to uh, clear the beachhead by himself. Okay, this group here, so that's uh, the four guys, um, they're going to move towards the castle through the village. These are the guys that, that get stuck with that particular detail, right? That sounds about right. And, yeah, it, does, it doesn't make a ton of sense why... Well, yeah, no, they've got to split up with... Um, I guess they do all have their own different tasks, right? Yeah, they do. There are different forces charged yeah. with doing different things based on again i guess on their specialties and their weaponry yeah i think that he was trying to i think that's what he was trying to do is that they all have something unique to offer well i guess that's uh yeah because like i said I, I think there was that mandate from hasbro to include everybody uh in the comic here as so often you, as possible all the vehicles yeah yeah, yeah. so you got to come up with a big mission that everybody can do something specific in um so it does that end up getting a little bit jumbled but uh that's okay. Uh, we're going to cut here to inside Cobra HQ, where a couple of survivors from the beach attack are reporting to Cobra Commander. Here. I thought that was cool. They're coming in. They just got their ass kicked. I don't know. I just thought that's kind of cool. Cool. Yeah. Well, I mean, later on, you know, the, the, the Cobra Commander from the show, if somebody had reported failure to him, he would have thrown a hissy fit, right? Yeah. I'm surrounded by idiots and something stupid. Yeah. yeah right. Right. Whereas he's like, shit, some of you survived? <laughs> I was not expecting that. So Baroness says, uh, let's see. 
I say we kill the hostage now, send out fire teams to sweep the whole island, and Cobra Commander's like, nope, that's what they want us to do. This initial landing is a feint to draw my troops away from the fort so they can set up for a heavy assault, which will land on a closer beach. Yeah, so could you see the cartoon commander saying any of that? I I can barely see the cartoon commander <laughs> tying his shoes. <laughs> And when, yeah, so therefore, so yeah, since he has the, the leverage, they have the doctor. Right, right, right. So we're just going to sit here and wait for them to come to us with our full strength. Yeah, she's kind of panicking a little bit, right? Like yeah. she's she's given up already. Yeah, no, that, that is interesting. Like kind of squabbling uh, leaders in, a, in, in, a, in an organization. You can see that kind of being the case. It's just like, oh, no, wait, this actually makes a lot more sense. And you know what's cool too? Another thing I, I had noted was, Another smart little touch that Larry Hammer did was Cobra. This is basically their army. We're looking at it here. Like they didn't have a lot early on, but Not then as the yeah. series progressed, they got more weapons, more soldiers. You know, they advanced mm -hmm. as an as an enemy. You know, they started out as kind of like a small band. I always pictured they'd have a couple of hundred soldiers and some tanks and whatnot. But then by issue fifty, they have this massive army. Yeah, because you know, they, they would win and they would succeed sometimes and they would recruit, you know, more soldiers and more people into their way of life. That is like a weird. Yeah, no, that doesn't really jive at all with, you know, growing up with toys in the 80s <laughs> where you right. just have like a static force versus a static force. Another the, static force. Right. Yeah. I, I always I, maybe I might be thinking too much into it, but it's I always kind of envision Cobra growing. Which caused G.I. Joe to have to grow and they'd have to recruit and they'd have to bring in more. No, I think you might be right about that. There. So, uh, okay, from here we're going to cut to this is uh, Flash and Short Fuse, I think, breaking into the electrified fence here. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. And these two don't seem to be the brightest ones, which I like. At least, you know, they're, they're not all just hyper competent all the time. Uh, but uh, yeah. Uh, what is it? I think Short Fuse first is looking for the wire uh, that powers the, the fence here. And he's like, oh, man, no, there's no cable. There's, there's just a quarter-inch steel pipe. I was like, yeah, that's that's where the cable is. <laughs> you don't think and you then, know that. <laughs> yeah. And then um, Flash here, yeah, he hits it with his laser rifle. Yeah. Which, uh, yeah, if you severed that live cable, the whole mission would have been blown. He's like, yeah, but it worked. Like, well, he's got a do something unique with his laser instead of just shooting. Yeah. Everybody true. else is shooting. Right. So he's got to have something. Yeah. So, something that just he could do. Right. Exactly. Yeah. And then we got uh, snake eyes and scarlet repelling into the tower itself. Which is cool as hell. Yep. And I think their, their job is to break in and uh, destroy the generator. Right. And then we get uh, back to the first team here. So yeah, their job is to destroy the airfield, except for one, uh, for one craft. For them to get away, right? Yeah. And was that and a this... hydrofoil? Is that what that? Yeah. So this is uh, we're going to cut back to the base briefly because I guess it, it's it's an interesting little A side where it's where they go back to the plan here, and so this is the hydrofoil that the main uh, frontal assault is going to uh, store the beachhead with the other beach, and that's to get the vehicles feature it into the into right the yep big time and so these are okay and these are the other ones that are are going to be in on the uh on the hydrofoil here and that's where hawk is grand slam zap okay where's zap yep <laughs> never catching a break <laughs> so that first team destroy the aircraft here with a mortar which is kind of an interesting choice because it's just like Again, you you wouldn't expect it to be something that specific, I guess, except that yeah, it's seems... Lariama. And from there, so yeah, from this, uh, all this shock and awe stuff, um, we're going to cut to back to the uh, the covert team of Snake Eyes and, uh, and Scarlet breaking in and just incapacitating guys silently, which I think is a nice uh, contrast, actually. Do you like that sequence of panels? I'm thing? okay with it, yeah. I don't think it's I don't think it's particularly excitingly drawn, but I like the concept of it. It's just Trumpy doesn't have much flair, I guess, right? No, and I mean, part of it is that there's not enough room to put in some awesome, a lot of awesome stuff. Yeah, yeah. Like he's having to pack in an awful lot on these. Pages. I know he's got this is a tough job for him. Yeah. 
And those are a lot of panels too on these two pages. Mm -hmm. We get like these little hints here, like Cobra Commander wants a constant radar check on the Southern Sea of, uh, on the Southern Sea approaches, and nothing there at the moment. But it just you know makes him again again aware that something's um, coming. He knows that there there's going to be a secondary assault. Right. So this would be Flash and Short Fuse coming back from their mission, meeting up with Stalker, Grunt, and Sh uh, and Short Fuse. Shit, I'm confusing the few, all of them now. Short Fuse was in this group then. I thought Short Fuse was with Flash. He's the oh, one that said this is Breaker. Oh fuck's sake! Oh, it is Breaker. All right, all right. Okay. There we go. Okay. We see. That's, they have all the same uniform. That's why it gets confusing. Absolutely. Unless they mention their name, which they would do awkwardly. You know, every once say, hey, in a while, Breaker. yeah, they would just mention their names a lot, but you really, really got to, much. yeah, you really got to get to the point where they have like differentiating uniforms, which is probably more of a pain in the ass to draw, but like at least it's easier to read, yeah, true. Uh, okay, so from here, we cut back to the inside where um, Cobra Commander is receiving more reports that the G.I. Joe Heavy Assault Team has landed in their many awesome vehicles, <laughs> three awesome. You got the Ram, you got the Mobat, and you got the Vamp, which are all awkward acronyms. I like the Vamp. That's this one That's here, a right? Multi purpose attack vehicle. Oh, towing right. the HAL, which is the heavy artillery laser. <laughs> and then the Ram is the rapid assault motorcycle. All right. I got it. I got it all. And the Mobat right. is the motorized uh, something battle tank. I don't remember what exactly, okay. moment, but they're all they're all acronyms for. Awkward that makes acronyms. sense. Yeah, and and Hama loves his acronyms. And military jargon loves acronyms. Yep, even when it's not always necessary. And yeah, this is going to be yeah, just rolling in and blowing everything up. We've got our foxholes and our barbed wire, and they're just kind of rolling through and uh, yeah, destroying everything. That's some fun shit. I think it's multiple ordnance battle tank, and I think they just dropped the A. Sorry, I, I, get, <laughs> I just had to get that out. I knew I knew it, but I just couldn't. That's all right. And, okay, so in back in the uh, Cobra Command here, and Baroness can't uh, is apparently too impatient to let Doctor Burkhart live. But I mean, Cobra Commander still wants to get the the secrets out of her. I imagine. So Baroness is still trying to kill. Yeah, she's, she's still trying to jump the gun on the whole thing. Yeah, there's something going on with those two. Baron is just, I don't know, they got some kind of beef. She just doesn't like the doctor. So from here we cut, this is the fishing village they and they um they mentioned earlier. Uh, this, by the way, was one of the reasons that they couldn't just like drop a bomb on the yeah, whole island. That was, was discussed, because, wasn't yeah. it? Didn't someone say, can we just fly into B-52s and just take they out did. the whole island? They did, yeah. And they, they said we can't because there's a civilian element on there. Um, and it looks like uh, Cobra has rolled through and wiped everybody out, which is dark. I'm not sure if I get the the point of that, other than just to like kind of slow GI Joe down a little bit. Hmm. Yeah. Why would they do that? Just because they're especially ruthless. I, like it does show that that uh, you know, like Cobra isn't fucking around. Like there's no advantage to keeping them around. They can only be a pain in the ass to us. Mm -hmm. Right, it's just why not? I guess. I guess. I right? guess. Yeah, like that. That's the only. That's one of the things that it doesn't seem to be like a clear advantage doing that. For, well, maybe. Uh, I yeah. mean, they could be worried about maybe some kind of resistance, maybe. you know, from or, or uprisings or insurgency. Me, yeah, maybe find you know like secret entries, like you know, finding secret ways to get in or something. Yeah. Right. Who knows? Um, okay, so from there we get the Cobra tanks, and they're going to deliver. Dr. Burkhart to the airfield. Oh, that's okay. So that's why they left the one light craft was uh, to basically bait Cobra into. Um, oh, I see. Yeah, okay. delivering Dr. Burkhart so that they could still so get the off. One craft. Okay, okay. That's, yeah. that's not that's not bad. That's not I like it. Like again, it's like a, a for real tactic. Yeah, that I've been I've been reading brigade issues, man. <laughs> would would Liefeld come up with something? Like Liefeld, that. Eric Stevens, no, they, they their their tactics are, you know, just punch. I, pretty much, get everybody together, and then I'll punch, <laughs> or split them up and punch separately. 
<laughs> but beyond punching, that's 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 all we got. <laughs> that's we pretty get, much it. Yeah. <laughs> Punch harder if that doesn't work. Oh, yep. man, Liefeld. Why would yep. you bring up I was having such a good night and then you brought up Liefeld. <laughs> I was feeling good. Well, I just got through the uh the extreme prejudice thing. Um I, I did that whole fucking crossover. And it there's times where it seems like they're trying to do for real tactics and, and strategies. And it's like they don't come anywhere close. And it's fucking pathetic. And just going from that to this, where it's like, oh shit, like people trying doing interesting things, like trying to team objectives. Yes. Yeah. Like, it's, I don't know. Life I wouldn't have Cobra eradicate the natives for no reason whatsoever. You wouldn't have them working many groups to with individual objectives. Well, like look at this thing, because like uh G.I. Joe does stop the convoy. You know, they with the they just mine the, the road here. And um, yeah, so they're able to stop all that. And Stalker swoops in and picks up the doctor, except it's not the doctor. It's the Baroness in disguise. Yeah, right. So there's like, there's a, there's an element of like, you know, I know what you're trying to do, but I know that you know that I know what you're trying to do. Yeah, so, right. You know, yeah. So they're like yes. kind of counter move against each other. Right. Like the cat and mouse back and forth. Yes. It's great. Which is cool. And especially if you're a kid, that's especially cool. Yeah. Right, to have the mask ripped off, and she's like, whoa. Just back to Cobra Commander with Dr. Burkhart. So he's starting to explain some of his plan. So for that, he has to don his special combat helmet. To explain the plan? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it can't really explain it through this hood. No, you, would, you wouldn't take me nearly as seriously. <laughs> All right, so let me change, and then I'll explain my plan. When the entire team, the G.I. Joe team, is inside the castle... Cobra Commander is going to activate a five-minute timer on his wrist that will detonate five tons of high explosives, which is buried under the fort. Uh, so Cobra Commander is going to get away with Dr. Burkhart. Um, I assume Baroness will probably escape, and G.I. Joe will be destroyed in the explosion is the idea. All right, so here's a problem I have. If this was – Baroness clearly had to be in on this. Mm-hmm. She got into the costume and whatnot. Well, I mean, she's been impatient and not really in on the plan – up until now, right? Well, that's why I'm saying uh, she, there's several times when she's suggested let's just kill her. Yeah. But she clearly had to be prepared to do this. If she knew about this part of it. Oh, you don't think she knew about this part? I'm not for sure. It could go either way, to be honest. Okay. Right. I mean, I, I don't think uh, Cobra Commander would have too much of a problem with, you know, sacrificing her if it meant he got away. Okay, so you think... She commander might have been like all right listen this is what's gonna happen now you gotta dress up like her they're gonna swoop in and grab you you may or may not make it potentially i mean there there could be some other aspect of it where they're expecting to pick her up or you know, they expect her to come back in time or something but there's okay. you know there's a there's a few different ways it could go so anyway the mobat here yep is gonna go like frontal assault on the gates of the castle um snake eyes and scarlet now are gonna you know be less covert and they're the first ones to get to Cobra Commander and the Doctor. Meanwhile, all the other Joes are... They basically got into the courtyard and they're having to fend off the Cobra soldiers here. Who, again, yeah, are getting shot, which is getting great. Killed. <laughs> Every time no, it happens, you, is, I feel like I have to make You're celebrating of. their demise. Like, people Absolutely. are dying and you're like, yeah, hey, that's fun. <laughs> but none of the G.I. Joes are even getting... Well, no, because I mean, you know, they're they're names. They 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 got names, right? They if have you're names. In, if you're in a Larry Hammett GI Joe comic and you don't have a code name and a weird looking costume, like you just stay it's home not, that day. I feel not, like it's not going to be good. It's not going to end well for you. No, not really. All right, so Cobra Commander's in a bit of a standoff with Snake Eyes and Scarlet here, where they can't make a move on him because you know he's got the gun up to the Doctor's head. So he's like, okay. I'm going to get on board the helicopter with the doctor um, and like a sliding door, a big old, a big thick uh, steel door slides down, trapping them all in. So um, once I leave, the timer's going to run out uh, in five minutes and then the door will pop back up again. You can take off if you like. <laughs> and he's got the battle helmet on. Yeah. Which is important. And, and, and the doctor, uh, spoils it for him and and he's like what are you no you're not supposed to wreck it i thought you were in on this <laughs> <laughs> and he does shoot her uh just in the arm though and yeah scarlet 
uh, disarms him with her ninja stars. Oh, wait, is that the Baroness there? It is. Too. I think that's the Baroness, right. Ah, so that kind of settles that. Meanwhile, the rest of the Joe forces, including Breaker, who still got the gum going. Always going to have gum. That's how yep. you know it's pretty, he'll be blowing a bubble or, every panel. Yep. So um, uh, G.I. Joe is able to break into the uh, the, the room here, and uh, Cobra, Commander, and Baroness have escaped through an underground passage here. Oh, so G.I. Joe's, yeah, they're just going to steal the helicopter and take off in that. So that works. Hmm. And with that, the uh, the castle explodes as the timer winds down. Not the most impressive explosion, but again, we're on the clock here. Could they have just left the castle, let it explode, and get picked up later? Who? Uh, G.I. Joe? G.I. Joe. Did they need to steal the helicopter? I think, well, I mean, there was only five minutes from when Cobra Commander was in there. I think speed was of the essence. Well, couldn't they just go to a different part of the island, is what I'm saying? Just get away from the castle. And it, it didn't explode. The whole island didn't blow up. You know, you know what I mean? Yeah. No, that's true. And that's what I would suggest if I was with him. I'd be like, I don't know. I don't know if I trust this helicopter. I don't know if it's got fuel. I don't know if he tr- put well, bombs in the helicopter. I don't know if I trust this guy. Let's just get out of the castle and call for radio for pickup. Everyone knows we're here. Maybe, but then again, we're at the end of the uh, of the issue of the story. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I guess the helicopter's fine. All right, so, if you're, <laughs> so, so if you're a hawk, that's how you'd respond. You'd be like, "Listen, we're at the yeah. end of the story. There's no way it's bombed. We're getting it's not in the helicopter. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we're on page twenty nine. We gotta. It'll be fine. Yep. Uh, so yeah, the doctor now has had her mind changed about. Um, the military, essentially. Yeah. <laughs> Where, Which is see, understandable, I suppose. Yeah, she still feels that all of her political actions were justified, but at least now she knows that there, uh, somewhere in the Pentagon, there are people who care. So that's something. Uh, that's and something. Uh, even though they did float the idea of letting her die and bombing the entire Well, they probably island, won't so. mention that to her on the ride back. <laughs> they probably no, won't that's, bring that part up. There, that's neat to know, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I might and, just be a pain in the ass i might mention it yeah maybe and cobra commander and baroness escape on that one plane that was left for them there yes wait that's a that's a christmas i wonder if, if you subscribe to if you mailed that now no nothing's coming back i know wouldn't you be curious <laughs> to see what would i think maybe you might if you're lucky get a letter from some board editor being like you did you actually think this is going to work <laughs> <laughs> does that have the prices for the subscriptions oh let's see uh holiday savings on marvel comics special nine issue subscription nine issues that's weird yeah, that's for 525 yeah. so less than a dollar each 75 cent let's see 58 cents a copy instead of the 75 cent newsstand price and that includes ship that includes postage add two dollars okay. nine issues. no that yeah i think that does i've enclosed 525 for each nine issue subscription they don't mention postage mm-hmm. Uh, although they do say Canada and foreign at two dollars per title. See, that would have messed you up, right? A little bit. Well, I didn't have like what, but seven twenty-five American or not? I'm not for sure. <laughs> if if they, I don't think they would have accepted seven twenty-five Canadian. Uh, that was outside my price range, though. In 1988. <laughs> All right, so you weren't buying the. You couldn't afford the USS flag either. Is, is, is no, no. I mean, I I only got like four dollars a week, man. <laughs> <laughs> oh, here's the and pit. we get our breakdown of the pit. Yes, which I did not read through. It's under but... Fort Wadsworth. Yep. See, there's the oh, there's the the there's one vehicle actually that was not used in that issue from all the original vehicles, and what that was that? the flak cannon. Is that this one here? I don't know if that's the flak because the flak I thought I thought the vamp was wheel. was dragging it. No, that was the HAL, the heavy artillery laser. Oh, uh, okay. The flak is the field launch attack cannon. Mm-hmm. with a K. But it didn't have uh, wheels, so it would have been pretty useless in that mission. Right, it's I got suppose. the tripod. To, like, yeah, so they would have had to fly it in or parachute it in or something. It wouldn't yeah. really worked. Yeah, I don't the see the training room here. Oh, I guess this is supposed to be it here. Okay. 
That's the training. Because you got the you got the target practice here. That's about it. It's a little simplified, but that's okay. And Trimpy did this too. Um, I would assume the actual blueprints are interesting, and I don't think match up with what we saw earlier at all. <laughs> it's kind of like the oh primary staging area, training area. Uh, actually, this might be kind of close. This is the third level, so one, two, three. Yeah, okay. Yeah, it seems about right. Hmm. Okay. Not bad. Not bad. Okay, so this is the backup feature in this. This is hot potato. And uh, this is a, a much smaller story. So, and this is not drawn by Herb Trimpy. This is drawn by Tom. Um, this is drawn by Don Perlin. Okay, and it's right. not quite as good visually as the Trimpy stuff, in my opinion, which is, you know, not great. <laughs> <laughs> You're not saying good things about Don Perlin. Eh, the art is no, no Herb Trimpy. Is yeah. Question. I think uh, he's one of the Valiant guys, one of the first Valiant guys. Yeah, I think on. you're right. I think you're right. I want to say he drew Magnus, but I'm not for sure. I think you might be right. Yeah. Um, and he's better by that, at least. He's better uh, than what we're looking at here. This is kind of rough. It's, it's, it's a little, yeah, uh, simplistic. But, um, okay, so we're in some Middle Eastern country. So, and we're going to get our, our traditional Larry Hama breakdown because Larry Hama knows what's up. So, Scarlet Rock and Roll Snake Eyes are two hours overdue. Uh, the Mad Colonel Sharif has been known to be head jaywalkers, so why don't we just bop across the border? Um, and gets cut off by negative clutch. We're sitting on the only escape route out of Sharif's Emirate. Our job is to secure it until Sar Scarlet and the others can safely pass through with the tape. So, um, Scarlet and Snake Eyes and Rock and Roll got, went over a border, probably, you know, uh, undercover. And went and uh, ac acquired some tape, which they're trying to bring back. And they got ambushed by this colonel's forces. And so Scarlet's been wounded. Mm. This is the team of Joes that's that's supposed to be there to meet them and uh, kind of escort them off to for exfiltration. But uh, you know they're overdue. This kind of stuff. And yeah, they're behind enemy lines. So what they're going to try and do? They basically so they don't have any transport. If Scarlet sticks with the team, then she's going to slow them down. They're going to get caught by Sharif. So she's telling Rock and Roll and Snake Eyes they have to take off for the meet with the tape, and she will hold off uh, the colonel and his forces at least long enough for them to get away. So she's planning to sacrifice herself on this one. That's a cool setup. That's yeah. a really cool setup. And at first, rock and roll is like, no, you know, we're not leaving you here to die. And it's like, that's an order kind of shit. You know, this mission is too important. You know, we're Joes. This is the, you know, this is kind of the, the risk we take sometimes. And Snake Eyes, what does he say here? He's going to force it with his persuader if he has to, which is which is the name of his Uzi, I guess. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> So he's following his orders. Rock and roll has to follow his, and she's going to do what she can to cover them. And she has to put a gun on Snake Eyes to make sure he goes with rock and roll. She's going to shoot him if he doesn't. Well, you know, just 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 getting it out there. And yeah. Like, don't you don't you think so? Of sticking I'm around serious. here? I'm serious. Yeah. I'm I'm not joking around here. Yeah. So uh, shortly thereafter, rock and roll and Snake Eyes are just kind of sprinting across the dunes. Rock and roll is bitching the whole time. And he talks about here, I, I used to think you had some feelings for Scarlet, which they will expand they will. on later. Yeah, They do have some feelings. But this is the first mention of it. Um, and he's like, okay, I must have been wrong. Listen, you could take the tape and let me go back for her. And and then when he turns around, Snake Eyes has already left. <laughs> so Rock and Roll has the tape. He's on his own. Snake Eyes is going back to uh, help Scarlet fend off the uh, the colonel's forces. So here we are back at where Scarlet's uh, holed up, and she's got a little bit of cover, and she's going to have her Rambo moment, where she's like, come on, you creeps. <laughs> if you want to be, they're called the Guardians of Paradise, and you're like, if you want to be the Guardians of Paradise, I'll send you to Paradise, which is nice and tough. That's, that's nice. Yeah. And, you know, again. 72 virgins. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and gunning down all, yeah, all these guys coming up on her. Wait, this and, looks like Valiant, doesn't it? Doesn't this look like a Valiant? 
a little bit stuff like this yeah just even like the coloring it just the panel layout it just looks like valid. i think i the panel layout yes but i mean this is shooter too right shooter yes wants it is shooter prioritizes clarity and uh you know i valiant is also a shooter so he's going to do the right. same thing over there the color i think is better than what they have with valiant this is oh, at least doc, so. yeah this is at least doc martin dies uh part of this is of the color in this is that it's um, this higher quality paper that the reprints have, okay, which I'm right. not a fan of. Oh, I don't, you don't like that. You don't like that. I don't like it personally. I don't think the color mixes well with it. I like it better on newsprint. Okay. Yeah. So yeah, she gets a few um, who try to you know come up on her, and then Snake Eyes comes to well, not, not exactly to the rescue, but he's going to be there for the last stand at least. So then cut back to the border town. Where the uh, yeah so the meeting force here uh, still waiting for them. This is uh, hours later, I think. So Hawk, I know Hawk and Stalker are here. Uh, they don't really mention anybody else. Something comes crashing through the window. Everybody uh, jumps because they think it's a grenade, but it's actually a stone. And wait, is it stone? Yeah, stone tied to the tape. Mm, okay. And then and then you hear an engine start up, and rock and roll is taken off with one of those motorcycles with a sidecar so they've got the tape somebody's gonna have to take off for um take the tape off to uh where it's supposed to you know where it, its eventual destination but you know rock and roll he's gonna go try and help out his buddies let's see stalkers like we wouldn't go he wouldn't go back unless scarlet and snake eyes were still alive we got to go back and help him and then Hawk is like, no, they put everything on the line to get that tape this far. We can't fumble the pass. So yeah, again, being kind of a <laughs> being kind of a buzzkill. I like the way you read that. Yeah. It's very dramatic. Oh yeah. Okay, so this is Colonel Sharif. He's just pumping up his troops. Um, what and yeah, he get, kind of gives a little speech here, you know. Are we not the sworn protectors of the Emirates? We must overwhelm these infidels with the power of our spirit, that kind of stuff. Um, basically just kind of we need something here in the background while rock and roll makes his way to uh, the foxhole here. And yeah, cut back to Snake Eyes and Scarlet, and they're running low on ammo. I like how this rifle here looks exactly like a toy. <laughs> it I, does I, look I, like a toy. Yeah, all this stuff here it looks like I'm pretty sure what you would have gotten with the figure. But that it's funny because from time to time you can see the vehicles are drawn exactly like the toy like you could see little handles i i think that was a mandate yeah you think that was really I or it's just I, I always had the impression the artist was just given the toy here draw this I, and, and they didn't know what i think they would have extrapolated a bit more um i think there was yeah either a mandate from uh, probably from hasbro to keep it as close to the uh the toys as possible i don't think that's a bad idea either um i, I talked about that in the uh the yearbook video um if it if it's if it looks too different from what's in the comics mm -hmm. there might be a little bit of difficulty uh kind of bridging that gap uh the suspension of disbelief I see. whereas okay. if you see it and like you know the proportions are the same and it looks exactly like the toy it you, you know you can enact it exactly right okay. i don't know if that, that makes sense and i never thought of it that way but you might be right because if you're cool, a kid, you actually. want what you see, you want what you see, right? So even if it has like little toy elements, if it's a tank that has some kind of, you know, handle or something or battery yeah. case, you know, you'd want it to be as accurate as possible. You want to get what you're seeing in the comic. That's a good. Yeah, I, I never thought of that. I I think there's I don't know because I, I every once in a while I think I'd have the toy of whatever I was playing with. And you'd always get a little bit of disappointment. It's like, well, this isn't the real thing. This is the yeah, right, you know? right, right, right. The, the real version doesn't have this and this and this. But if you see all that extra stuff in the comic, I feel like that uh, kind of eases it a bit. That's interesting. I never thought of that. You, but I think you might be right. Yeah. So they're able to gun down this last wave of the, uh, the colonel's forces. And that's it. They have no more ammo left, uh, except for two bullets. Which Scarlet says, you know, I've been saving two shots in my backup oh, piece. That's I don't know about you, but I don't want to be captured. Wow. How yeah, it, dark, they actually, dude. they went there in the first issue. Jeez. Except coming over the hill is rock and roll in the motorcycle, and he guns down. Uh, I, I assume the rest of that immediate force anyway. 
And so, yeah, they're able to pile on. Scarlet gets behind him, and uh, Snake Eyes gets the sidecar, and they take off back over the dunes. This is a one of the Colonel's uh, planes here. And it's going to yeah chase him down. You can't really do a chase very well in a comic, but even then, this isn't done particularly well. But <laughs> it's, He's no Herb Trimpy. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but um, this is the, the vamp, right? Yeah, that's the vamp. Yeah, so this is Hawk and whoever else was there uh, was in the um, the meetup there. They all piled into one of the cars and they were able to follow rock and roll across the desert and they come to the rescue just in time. So now they can all just kind of escort each other back over the border. Meanwhile, Stalker's already on the plane heading home. Yeah, the steward has asked him if she wants if he wants anything with his steak. He says, "Yep, make it a uh, let's get a potato, make it real hot." Oh, just nice. tying it all together. Yeah. That was a cool little story. I like that one. It's it was uh, concise, it's, a, it's more it was cool. It's more focused than the first one, I think. Yeah, it's more it's yeah, it's not elaborate, but it just kind of shows their mindset. Mm -hmm. It was a little dark. Yeah. Even the enemy was kind of you know, kids aren't gonna understand like infidels and you know, no, like and then, you know they them. mentioned like the I think they mentioned like the seventy two versions and all that shit too. Actually, <laughs> I know I did. <laughs> I Maybe. know you did. <laughs> okay, they don't go quite that far, but they do say a special place in, is promised in paradise for all who fall in the cause. Right. So it's I mean, you know, kind of scraping the edge of it. Yeah, it is scraping the edge a little bit. Yeah. And uh, from here we get some classified files. So these are, I guess, kind of the proto file cards that would eventually end up on the toys. Do you know uh, who did that pinup? This is Michael Golden. Okay. Yeah. It's pretty good. It is. It's quite a bit better than anything else in the issue. But you could only get so much out of Michael Golden. Uh, right. The fact that we have like an entire, pretty much an entire story in the yearbook is is kind of stunning, really. Have you ever checked out the NAM? I have um, most, I think like the first 10 or 11 issues of that. Which are... Talk, right? Yeah, he did. He did uh, do all that, and uh, Larry Hama was his editor at the time, actually. So yeah, we're just oh, gonna get. Uh, so I'm surprised he didn't work more on. Uh, I I don't. It, Michael Golden seems to do what Michael Golden wants. You know, if okay. uh, yeah, like he'll if he likes a project, he'll he'll go on it for a little while, but it doesn't seem like it's ever for too long, and he usually takes too long to do it because he's just noodling away on it forever. Like, yeah, look at all, he's very like look deep. at all this shit here. You gotta draw every goddamn potato. Right, right. And right, shade right. them all too. Yeah, that's pretty crazy. You yeah. think he was an influence of McFarlane? Yes. Yeah. I think I think McFarlane is, is was directly influenced by Michael Golden. Uh, but Michael Golden was also a direct influence of Art Adams as well. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Just that um, you know, more pile on the detail kind of style. Mm, yeah. Uh, yeah, I guess this is him too, eh? Yeah, because I again the just the fidelity on everything is turned up. Cool. It, it, and he's really good at drawing like military hardware and things like yeah, that. Yeah, in that yearbook that I saw, he was he was just putting so much detail on like every gun and every vehicle. It was great. And yeah, this is all just the 1988 ads. Remember that one at least. All right. That was an adventure. Yeah, exactly. That is it for Tales of G.I. Joe number one, anyway. Pretty close to G.I. Joe number one. Uh, any final thoughts? Um, that was fun. I don't know. It was like a trip down memory lane. Memory yeah. lane. Yeah, no, that was good. That was I liked it. I enjoyed oh, it. Good. I'm glad. I, I might do more G.I. Joe issues in the future. I do have, actually, like the first 10 now, I think, well, in one form wanna, or another. If you want to do something fun... Number 20 is horrifically awful. Okay. So that, that was just kind of like a throw-in issue. Is like, you know, when major story arcs kind of end and it, before the next one begins, they just have like one or two like okay, yeah, fill-in issues. Thing. Yeah, it wasn't even by Hama. Didn't write it. I don't really? Know the artist. Yeah, it, he didn't write it. It was just, it was. I know there's like, yeah, like maybe a half dozen issues that Hama didn't write over the course. Yeah, and this was one and it was hideous so bad that it was amazing so i tend to skip that kind of issue generally unless it's like you know like hilariously bad it's hilariously bad 
Oh, okay. It's kind of like I don't know. You ever see a movie that's just so bad that you, you love it, like Roadhouse um, or something? You know, like occasionally, it's comically bad. <laughs> well, if you're interested in an, an awful issue, that would be a good one to, to look right. into. Maybe one day. I, I with these, I tend to try to build up to them. So I may just uh, do a few more from the beginning here, where they're kind of trying to get their, I don't know, get their feet under them first. Well, it's it's kind of you'll see it's pretty inconsistent. You know, so like number two is pretty good. Three is awful. Okay. Four is good. You can see how they're kind of getting their sea legs and figuring things out. Because it's very, from issue to issue, the quality is pretty uh, stark. So I'm curious to see what your opinions are of one through ten. Okay. Well, I I get, yeah, it's interesting because I I imagine they wouldn't really know what they're doing with it at first. It's just, okay, let's do some. I understand that uh, the first four or five issues are just. Uh, basically self-contained it story. Yes. Yeah. Pretty much one through ten are. I think, I don't know if Hannah, I think it's seven and eight are, are kind of like back-to-back, but the others are all just self-contained. And a bunch don't even have Cobra in them, you know, so they're just fighting different. Well, I know the October Guard gets introduced pretty early. The October Guard, that's in that two-part story. But there's also, yeah. they fight like this right-wing militia. They fight... Uh, okay. They just get involved in different groups that don't even feature Cobra. I, I think it just kind of seems like they didn't know, like you said, where this is going to go. So yeah. they probably just took it month by month. I think by issue like 11, it picked up like an ongoing continuity. So maybe by then it kind of right. established itself. But I'm just curious what you're dying to see what your thoughts are. All right. Well, I, you know, I'll have to check them out at the time. Then I haven't read them yet. So uh, I guess I'll wrap this up here then. So thanks very much for stopping by, man. Appreciate it. No, this is fun. Appreciate your expertise. Right down to the acronyms. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yeah, that'll do it for G.I. Joe number one. Thanks very much for watching. If you like this video, please hit like, hit subscribe, hit the notifications so you know when the next one's coming out. Go over and subscribe on my Patreon. That'll give you access to everything I do from the Blood Force stuff to the YouTube videos before they get uploaded to YouTube, as well as some Patreon exclusive content. You can also follow me on Instagram and DM me there for commissions, and you can join the Blood Force Discord server. Um, that's usually where I run out of steam. <laughs> you got it though you got it you got it I, all in can't I, I don't always but yeah no manage that time so yeah that'll do it thanks again for watching i'll see you guys in the next one bye-bye